Is there shock quartz in the Carolina Bays? Many geologists have been insisting that in order to prove that the Carolina Bays are impact structures, it is necessary to show that they contain shock quartz or other evidence of shock metamorphism. This presentation examines the mechanism of bay formation to see if it was even possible that such materials formed when the bays were created. Many people who watched my last video were surprised when I pointed out that the book by Professor J. Meloche titled Planetary Surface Processes published in 2011 classifies the Carolina Bays as thermocars, which are basically sinkholes that filled with water. The textbook says, quote, such thaw lakes are common, creating landscapes packed with kilometer diameter circular to elliptical ponds that are often aligned with the prevailing wind. Such lakes constitute the infamous Carolina Bays, which impact crater enthusiasts persistently claim to be of impact origin, in spite of the complete lack of evidence for impacts. End quote. I pointed out that his statements represent a bias that is widespread in the geological community, and it is especially difficult to overcome when a respected impact expert like Professor Melosh promotes it. Professor Melosh passed away in 2020, but I corresponded with him while he was at the University of Arizona and later when he went to Purdue. I think that his statement of the complete lack of evidence for impacts for the Carolina Bays was based on the debates that were trending at the time that the book was written. Some of the viewers also asked, when did the Carolina Bays have permafrost? It is a fact that even during the last glacial maximum, there was no permafrost in North Carolina or South Carolina or Georgia. So the classification of the Carolina Bays as thermocars does not make sense if there was no permafrost in these states. The Carolina Bays are the most prevalent geological structures of the East Coast and they are found from New York to Florida. LIDAR has made it possible to examine them in great detail and they really deserve to be carefully studied. To understand why there was so much prejudice against the impact origin of the Carolina Bays, we need to look at their history, starting from the 1933 publication by Melton and Shriver, where these authors raised the question of whether the bays were meteorite scars. After considering other explanations, these university professors say that a hypothesis involving impact by a cluster of meteorites is presented as the most reasonable explanation. Nineteen years later, in 1952, the idea that the Carolina Bays could have been made by meteorites was still being avidly pursued. Professor Prouty wrote, Statistical studies of orientation show a greater divergence of smaller bays from the mean than the larger bays. Smaller bays also show greater variation in ellipticity than do larger bays. Both facts are most satisfactorily explained by the meteoritic theory of origin. Multiple and heart-shaped bays overlapping patterns explained most logically by the impact of tandem meteorites, some likely explosive in nature. Prouty spent a lot of time looking for magnetic anomalies that might reveal meteorite fragments. The study of meteor crater in Arizona by Eugene Shoemaker in 1960 changed the way in which impact craters were evaluated. Shoemaker established very specific criteria to distinguish extraterrestrial impact craters from similar terrestrial features such as volcanic calderas. Evidence of impacts had to include a crater with raised rims and overturned flaps, meteorite fragments, siderophile elements, shatter cones, and crystals with planar deformation features created by the high pressure of an extraterrestrial impact. These characteristics became the most trusted standard for identification of impact craters. In addition to working on extraterrestrial impacts, Eugene Shoemaker with his wife and David Levy discovered the comet that fragmented and crashed into Jupiter in 1994. Eugene Shoemaker had an illustrious career, but unfortunately he was killed in a car accident while visiting an impact crater in Australia. In one of my email communications with Professor Meloche, he gave me access to a PDF of his 1989 book called Impact Cratering, A Geologic Process, which was then out of print. This book has been very useful for my work on the Carolina Bays. One of the tables of the book lists petrographic shock indicators. Quartz develops planar deformation features at pressures of 5 to 35 gigapascals. Other quartz forms like stishovite and coesite form at pressures starting at 15 to 30 gigapascals. This image shows a shock quartz crystal under polarized light. The crystal has striations going in two directions. This is how quartz is deformed by the high pressure of an extraterrestrial impact. 
5 to 35 gigapascals of pressure are required to achieve this transformation, which is a much higher pressure than is produced in ordinary terrestrial events like volcanic eruptions. The quartz grain measures 0.13 mm across, which is smaller than the period at the end of a sentence. Just like Shoemaker's study of meteor crater changed the perception of impacts, the report by Zanner and Kusila that Nebraska had a multitude of oval-shaped features changed the way in which the Carolina bays were perceived. Zanner and Kusila attributed the formation of the Nebraska rainwater basins to blowouts on low spots, but they acknowledged that any explanation for the Carolina bays should also help to explain the Nebraska rainwater basins. Just five years later, in 2006, the book titled The Cycle of Comet Catastrophes by Firestone, West, and Warwick Smith proposed that a comet impact on the ice of Hudson Bay had sent massive lumps of glacier ice hurtling through the air that crashed into the Carolinas, Nebraska, and several other states. The earlier discovery by Sanner and Kusila made it possible to change the story of the creation of the Carolina Bays from being formed by meteorite fragments to being formed by secondary impacts of glacier ice. Firestone and his co-authors wrote, quote, One of the strongest arguments supporting the impact theory is this. The bays seem to be unique on the entire planet, and whatever process formed them is not creating any new bays. In other words, if common agents like wind and water had formed the bays instead of an impact, then wind and water should still be producing more bays at this moment somewhere on the vast land areas of our planet. End quote. In 2007, Firestone and 25 co-authors published a paper in the prestigious journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The paper proposed that an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the younger Dryas cooling. Some of the evidence presented consisted of magnetic microspherules, nanodiamonds, and other proxies of an extraterrestrial impact. No mention was made of the Carolina base except as a source of test material. The paper did not mention the location of a crater and no evidence of shock quartz was presented. This was a big red flag for the impact community that had embraced the criteria for extraterrestrial impacts developed by Eugene Shoemaker. Firestone published an additional paper in 2009. He admitted that the 2007 paper had unleashed an avalanche of controversy that he wanted to address. In this paper, Firestone proposed that an extraterrestrial airburst produced a high-temperature shockwave with powerful winds that raced across the continent, creating the impact debris rich Carolina Bays as it passed. Basically, Firestone changed the origin of the Carolina Bays from the secondary impacts of glacier ice that he had described in the 2006 book to an aeolian or wind-based mechanism in this 2009 publication. The critics launched a barrage of objections against Firestone's 2007 publication, which had been nicknamed the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. In 2011, Nicholas Pinter and six university professors declared the Requiem, which is a ritual for the dead. As far as these authors were concerned, the Younger Dryas Hypothesis proposed by Firestone and his 25 co-authors was dead because none of the impact proxies or mechanisms for the extraterrestrial impact could be confirmed. The expected impact markers of an extraterrestrial impact, like a crater and shock quartz, were missing. So, strictly speaking, there was no proof of an extraterrestrial impact. Professor Melosh, being an impact expert, must have been aware of Firestone's 2007 paper and all the drama regarding the lack of shock quartz while he was writing his book about planetary surface processes. The earlier studies by Milton and Shriver, and then by Prouty, had failed to produce any impact evidence. The fact that Firestone had switched from secondary impacts of glacier ice to aeolian mechanisms for the formation of the Carolina Bays must also have influenced Professor Mellish to write that there was a complete lack of evidence for impacts. So when Professor Mellish published his book in 2011, the statement that there was no impact evidence for the Carolina Bays was essentially correct. The only error was to classify the Carolina Bays as thermocarst because there never was permafrost as far south as the Carolinas or Georgia. In 2003, a team of scientists from Harvard University published an astonishing finding. A large platinum anomaly was found at the Younger Dry's boundary in an ice core from the Greenland ice sheet. This was equivalent to the iridium layer that was deposited after the impact that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. It was positive proof that an extraterrestrial impact had occurred. 
The scientists concluded that the platinum could have originated from an iron meteorite that was unlikely to result in an airburst or trigger wide wildfires proposed by the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. In any case, the unequivocal evidence for an extraterrestrial impact at the onset of the Younger Dryas amounted to a resurrection of an idea that had been declared dead. In 2017, in the middle of this controversy, I published a paper titled A Model for the Geomorphology of the Carolina Bays that described the four mechanisms of the glacier ice impact hypothesis. First, a meteorite impact on the Laurentide ice sheet ejected ice boulders in ballistic trajectories. The secondary impacts by the ice boulders liquefied on consolidated ground close to the water table. Oblique impacts of ice boulders on liquefied ground created inclined conical cavities, and viscous relaxation reduced the depth of the conical cavities to produce shallow elliptical bays. I have tried to apply mathematics to the study of the Nebraska rainwater basins and the Carolina Bays to get rid of all the hand waving that goes along with the wind and water hypothesis. I have shown that well-preserved Nebraska rainwater basins can be fitted with ellipses using a least squares method. Similarly, I have fitted the ellipses to the Carolina Bays using the least squares method. The results show that the Carolina Bays are mathematical conic sections, which implies that these basins must have originated as inclined conical cavities or penetration funnels. It will be very difficult to explain away the precise elliptical geometry and the radial orientation of these basins toward the Great Lakes by Aeolian and lacustrine mechanisms. The major axes of the Nebraska Rainwater Basins and Carolina Bays converge by the Great Lakes. This is a probable location of the extraterrestrial impact. There seem to be several intersection points, so it is possible that there were several impacts, perhaps from a fragmented comet. Identifying a convergence point for the Carolina Bays makes it possible to measure the distance to each basin and use ballistic equations to calculate launch speeds, time of flight, and the maximum height reached by the glacier ice boulders that made the base. Using various distances and launch angles, we can determine that the launch speeds range from 3 to 4 km per second. The times of flight were 6 to 9 minutes, and the heights reached were from 150 to about 370 km above the surface of the Earth. The time of flight of 6 to 9 minutes indicates that in this brief period of time, all the megafauna that were in the range of the ballistic sedimentation were killed. The Clovis people would have seen a flash in the sky that turned ominously dark. This was quickly followed by a powerful hailstorm of huge ice boulders coming at supersonic speed that turned the ground into quicksand and made deep inclined conical cavities. It was a quick death for all the creatures that were in the ballistic sedimentation zone during these horrific nine minutes. I have calculated that in some areas of South Carolina, the kinetic energy of the ice bombardment was approximately 8 megatons per square kilometer. Knowing the speed of the ice projectiles and the size of the Carolina base allows us to estimate the size and energy of the projectiles using power law scaling equations correlating the energy of an impact with greater size. Professor J. Meloche and Ross Bayer developed a calculator that takes into consideration the angle of impact and the target characteristics. According to this program, a Carolina Bay with a diameter of 1 km was made by an ice chunk with a diameter of 180 meters and a kinetic energy equivalent to 3 megatons of TNT. The ice chunk would be as big as a baseball stadium. We now have the information required to create a mathematical model of the extraterrestrial impact that made the Carolina Bays and the Nebraska rainwater basins. We can calculate launch angles, projectile speed, and kinetic energy. By adding the energy required to make all the impact basins, we can deduce the energy of the extraterrestrial impact. The idea that the Carolina Bays originated as inclined conical cavities can be tested with an experimental model. The impact of an ice projectile on a viscous target produces a conical cavity with overturned flanges. Viscous relaxation reduces the depth and the overturned flanges become raised rims around the elliptical cavity. Ellipses are conic sections, so it follows that inclined conical cavities produced by oblique impacts look elliptical when viewed from above. This experimental impact shows an ice projectile at the apex of the conical cavity and demonstrates the elliptical shape and the raised rims. This graphic illustrates the kinetic energy of the projectile at equal intervals of 1 15th of a second as the speed decreases by 600 meters per second during each time interval when the inclined conical cavity is formed. 
The rapid decay of kinetic energy during the formation of the penetration funnel does not allow the pressure to build sufficiently to create planar deformation features in quartz. All the energy is spent pushing apart the target material rather than compressing it. It may be possible that impacts of ice boulders on a relatively hard and immobile surface could have built enough pressure to create shock quartz before the ice disintegrated. The Carolina base in the gravel beds of Midlothian, Virginia may offer a possibility of finding shocked quartz. The only problem is that if the initial impacts of the ejecta curtain caused acoustic fluidization, the impacts that crashed into a bed of vibrating rocks may not have achieved the high pressure required to create shock quartz when the base formed. Another possibility for finding shock quartz may be in the Hickory Run boulder field in Pennsylvania. This is a boulder field that has not had any vegetation for thousands of years. Any secondary impacts of glacier ice on this field may have produced shock quartz. In a previous video, I identified several locations with different coloration that may correspond to impact locations. Pressure is defined as the amount of force applied perpendicular to the surface of an object per unit area. From the equation for pressure, it is evident that if a force is applied to an area that gets smaller and approaches zero, then the pressure will increase toward infinity. It should be possible to create shock quartz by hitting a very sharp quartz crystal with a hammer so that a great pressure develops at the tip of the crystal. Of course, it is necessary to wear goggles and protective equipment. You should also be aware that hitting a quartz crystal can produce electrical sparks due to the piezoelectric effect. Perhaps the best chance of finding shock quartz in the Carolina base would be in the Midlothian gravels or in the suspected impact locations of the Hickory Run boulder field. The shock portions will be at the contact points of adjacent quartz pieces where they were compressed against each other at the time of the glacier ice bombardment. Thank you for joining me in the investigation of the Carolina base and the Younger Dryas Cataclysm. There's a link to the LiDAR visualization tool in the description of the video. My book about the Carolina base is available at Amazon. Click on my face to subscribe to my YouTube channel and be notified of future videos about the Carolina base and other scientific topics.